Hello, this is JJ continuing to read from 1984 by George Orwell. Picking where we left off, picking up where we left off, uh, page 9 in chapter 1, Winston Smith just finished writing in his journal. If you want more context, watch the previous video called Pages 1 through 9. Okay, George Orwell, 1984. Winston stopped writing partly because he was suffering from cramp. He did not know what had made him pour out this stream of rubbish, but the curious thing was that while he was doing so, a totally different memory had clarified itself in his mind, to the point where he almost felt equal to writing it down. It was, he now realized, because of this other incident that he had suddenly decided to come home and begin the diary today. It had happened that morning at the ministry, if anything so nebulous could be said to happen. It was nearly 1100, and in the records department, where Winston worked, they were dragging the chairs out of the cubicles and grouping them in the center of the hall, opposite the big telescreen in preparation for the two minutes' hate. Winston was just taking his place in one of the middle rows, when two people whom he knew by sight but had never spoken to came unexpectedly into the room. One of them was a girl whom he often passed in the corridors. He did not know her name, but he knew that she worked in the fiction department. Presumably, since he had sometimes seen her with oily hands and carrying a spanner, she had some mechanical job on one of the novel writing machines. She was a bold-looking girl of about 27 with thick dark hair, a freckled face, and swift athletic movements. A narrow scarlet sash, emblem of the Junior Anti-Sex League, was wound several times around the waist of her overalls, just tightly enough to bring out the shapeliness of her hips. Winston had disliked her from the very first moment of seeing her. He knew the reason. It was because of the atmosphere of hockey fields and cold baths and community hikes and general clean-mindedness which she managed to carry about with her. He disliked nearly all women, and especially the young and pretty ones. It was always the women, and above all the young ones, who were the most bigoted adherents of the party. The swallowers of slogans, the amateur spies, and nosers out of unorthodoxy. But this particular girl gave him the impression of being more dangerous than most. Once, when they passed in the corridor, she had given him a quick, sidelong glance, which seemed to pierce right into him, and for a moment had filled him with black terror. The idea had even crossed his mind that she might be an agent of the thought police. That it was true was very unlikely. Still, he continued to feel a peculiar uneasiness which had fear mixed up in it as well as hostility whenever she was anywhere near him. The other person was a man named O'Brien, a member of the inner party and holder of some post so important and remote that Winston had only a dim idea of its nature. A momentary hush passed over the group of people around the chairs as they saw the black overalls of an inner party member approaching. O'Brien was a large, burly man with a thick neck and a coarse, humorous, brutal face. In spite of his formidable appearance, he had a certain charm of manner. He had a trick of resetting his spectacles on his nose, which was curiously disarming, in some indefinable way, curiously civilized. It was a gesture which, if anyone had still thought in such terms, might have recalled an 18th century nobleman offering his snuff box. Winston had seen O'Brien perhaps a dozen times in almost as many years. He felt deeply drawn to him, and not solely because he was intrigued by the contrast between O'Brien's urbane manner and his prize fighter's physique. Much more, it was because of a secretly held belief, or perhaps not even a belief, merely a hope, that O'Brien's political orthodoxy was not perfect. Something in his face suggested it irresistibly. And again, perhaps it was not even unorthodoxy that was written in his face, but simply intelligence. But at any rate, he had the appearance of being a person that you could talk to if somehow you could cheat the telescreen and get him alone. Winston had never made the smallest effort to verify this guess. Indeed, there was no way of doing so. At this moment, O'Brien glanced at his wristwatch, saw that it was nearly 1100, and evidently decided to stay in the records department until the two minutes hate was over. He took a chair in the same row as Winston, a couple of places away. A small, sandy-haired woman who worked in the next cubicle to Winston was between them. The girl with dark hair was sitting immediately behind. 
The next moment, a hideous grinding screech, as of some monstrous machine running without oil, burst from the big telescreen at the end of the room. It was a noise that set one's teeth on edge and bristled the hair at the back of one's neck. The hate had started. As usual, the face of Emmanuel Goldstein, the enemy of the people, had flashed onto the screen. There were hisses here and there among the audience. The little sandy-haired woman gave a squeak of mingled fear and disgust. Goldstein was the renegade and backslider who once, long ago, how long ago, nobody quite remembered, had been one of the leading figures of the party, almost on a level with Big Brother himself, and then had engaged in counter-revolutionary activities, had been condemned to death, and had mysteriously escaped and disappeared. The program of the two minutes hate varied from day to day, but there was none in which Goldstein was not the principal figure. He was the primal traitor, the earliest defiler of the party's purity. All subsequent crimes against the party, all treacheries, acts of sabotage, hearsays, deviations, sprang directly out of his teaching. Somewhere or other, he was still alive and hatching his conspiracies. Perhaps somewhere beyond the sea, under the protection of his foreign paymasters, perhaps even, so it was occasionally rumored, in some hiding place in Oceania itself. Winston's diaphragm was constricted. He could never see the face of Goldstein without a painful mixture of emotions. It was a lean Jewish face with a great fuzzle aureole of white hair and a small goatee beard, a clever face, and yet somehow inherently despicable with a kind of senile silliness in the long thin nose near the end of which a pair of spectacles was perched. It resembled the face of a sheep and the voice too had a sheep-like quality. Goldstein was delivering his usual venomous attack upon the doctrines of the party, an attack so exaggerated and perverse that a child should have been able to see through it, and yet just plausible enough to fill one with an alarmed feeling that other people, less level-headed than oneself, might be taken in by it. He was abusing Big Brother. He was denouncing the dictatorship of the party. He was demanding the immediate conclusion of peace with Eurasia. He was advocating freedom of speech freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, freedom of thought. He was crying hysterically that the revolution had been betrayed. And all this in rapid polysyllabic speech, which was a sort of parody of the habitual style of the orators of the party, and even contained newspeak words. More, more newspeak words, indeed, than any party member would normally use in real life. And all the while, lest one should be in any doubt as to the reality which Goldstein's specious claptrap covered, behind his head on the telescreen there marched the endless columns of the Eurasian army, row after row of solid-looking men with expressionless Asiatic faces, who swam up to the surface of the screen and vanished to be replaced by others exactly similar. The dull rhythmic tramp of the soldiers' boots formed the background to Goldstein's bleeding voice. Before the hate had proceeded for 30 seconds, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. The self-satisfied sheep-like face on the screen and the terrifying power of the Eurasian army behind it were too much to be borne. Besides, the sight or even the thought of Goldstein produced fear and anger automatically. He was an object of hatred more constant than either Eurasia or East Asia since when Oceania was at war with one of these powers, it was generally at peace with the other. But what was strange was that although Goldstein was hated and despised by everybody, although every day and a thousand times a day, on platforms on the telescreen, in newspapers, in books, his theories were refuted, smashed, ridiculed, held up to the general gaze for the pitiful rubbish that they were, in spite of all this, his influence never seemed to grow less. Always there were fresh dupes waiting to be seduced by him. A day never passed when spies and saboteurs acting under his directions were not unmasked by the thought police. He was the commander of a vast shadowy army, an underground network of conspirators dedicated to the overthrow of the state. The Brotherhood, its name was supposed to be. There were also whispered stories of a terrible book, a compendium of all the hearsays of which Goldstein was the author and which circulated clandestinely here and there. It was a book without a title. People referred to it, if at all, simply as The Book. But one knew of such things only through vague rumors. Neither the Brotherhood nor the book was a subject that 
any ordinary party member would mention if there was a way of avoiding it. In its second minute, the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the tops of their voices in an effort to drown the maddening, bleeding voice that came from the screen. The little sandy-haired woman had turned bright pink and her mouth was opening and shutting like that of a landed fish. Even O'Brien's heavy face was flushed. He was sitting very straight in his chair, his powerful chest swelling and quivering as though he were standing up to the assault of a wave. The dark-haired girl behind Winston had begun crying out, Swine! 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 And suddenly she picked up a heavy Newspeak dictionary and flung it at the screen. It struck Goldstein's nose and bounced off. The voice continued inexorably. In a lucid moment, Winston found that he was shouting with the others and kicking his heel violently against the rung of his chair. The horrible thing about the two minutes hate was not that one was obliged to act a part, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. Within 30 seconds, any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness, a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer, seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow lamp. Thus, at one moment, Winston's hatred was not turned against Goldstein at all, but on the contrary, against Big Brother, the party, and the Thought Police, and at, at such moments his heart went out to the lonely, derided heretic on the screen, sole guardian of truth and sanity in a world of lies. And yet the very next instant he was at he was at one with the people about him, and all that was said of Goldstein seemed to him to be true. At those moments, his secret loathing of Big Brother changed into adoration, and Big Brother seemed to tower up an invincible, fearless protector standing like a rock against the hordes of Asia, and Goldstein, in spite of his isolation, his helplessness, and the doubt that hung about his very existence, seemed like some sinister enchanter capable by the mere power of his voice of wrecking the structure of civilization. It was even possible at moments to switch one's hatred this way or that by a voluntary act. Suddenly, by the sort of violent effort with which one wrenches one's head away from the pillow in a nightmare, Winston succeeded in transferring his hatred from the face on the screen to the dark-haired girl behind him. Vivid, beautiful hallucinations flashed through his mind. He would flog her to death with a rubber truncheon. He would tie her naked to a stake and shoot her full of arrows like St. Sebastian. He would ravish her and cut her throat at the moment of climax. Damn. <laughs> Does the movie or this really happen in the book? Maybe this inspired the movie American Psycho. You guys should check that one out. Better than before, moreover, he realized why it was that he hated her. He hated her because she was young and pretty and sexless, because he wanted to go to bed with her and would never do so, because round her sweet, supple waist, which seemed to ask you to encircle it with your arm, it was only the odious scarlet sash aggressive symbol of chastity. The hate rose to its climax. The voice of Goldstein had become an actual sheep's bleat, and for an instant the face changed into that of a sheep. Then the sheep face melted into the figure of a Eurasian soldier who seemed to be advancing, huge and terrible, his submachine gun roaring and seeming to spring out of the surface of the screen, so that some of the people in the front row actually flinched backwards in their seats. But in the same moment, drawing a deep sigh of relief from everybody, the hostile figure melted into the face of Big Brother, black-haired, black-mustachioed, full of power and mysterious calm, and so vast that it almost filled up the screen. Nobody heard what Big Brother was saying. It was merely a few words of encouragement, the sort of words that are uttered in the din of battle, not distinguishable individually, but restoring confidence by the fact of being spoken. Then the face of Big Brother faded away again, and instead the three slogans of the party stood out in bold capitals. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. But the face of Big Brother seemed to persist for several seconds on the screen as though the impact that it had made on everyone's eyeballs were too vivid to wear off immediately. The little sandy-haired woman had flung herself forward over the back of the chair in front of her. With a tremulous murmur that sounded like, My Savior, she extended her arms toward the screen. Then she buried her face in her hands. It was apparent that she was uttering a prayer. At this moment, the entire group of people broke into a deep, slow, rhythmical chanting of BB, 
BB BB over and over again very slowly with a long pause between the first B and the second. A heavy murmurous sound somehow curiously savage in the background of which one seemed to hear the stamp of naked feet and the throbbing of tom-toms. For perhaps as much as 30 seconds they kept it up. It was a refrain that was often heard in moments of overwhelming emotion. Partly it was a sort of hymn to the wisdom and majesty of Big Brother, but still more it was an act of self-hypnosis, a, del a deliberate drowning of consciousness by means of rhythmic noise. Winston's entrails seemed to grow cold. In the two minutes, hate, he could not help sharing in the general delirium, but his soup, this subhuman chanting of B.B., B.B., al always filled him with horror. Of course, he chanted with the rest. It was impossible to do otherwise. To dissemble your feelings, to control your face, to do what everyone else was doing, was an instinctive reaction. But there was a space of a couple of seconds during which the expression in his eyes might conceivably have betrayed him. And it was exactly at this moment that the significant thing happened, if indeed it did happen. Momentarily, he caught O'Brien's eye. O'Brien had stood up, he had taken off his spectacles, and was in the act of resettling them on his nose with his characteristic gesture. But there was a fraction of a second when the eyes met, and for as long as it took to happen, Winston knew... Yes, he knew that O'Brien was thinking the same thing as himself. An unmistakable message had passed. It was through their two minds that ha had opened. It was though their two minds had opened and thoughts were flowing from one into the other through their eyes. I am with you, O'Brien seemed to be saying to him. I know precisely what you are feeling. I know all about your contempt, your hatred, your disgust, but don't worry, I am on your side. And then the flash of intelligence was gone, and O'Brien's face was as inscrutable as anybody else's. That was all, and he was already uncertain whether it had happened. Such incidents never had any sequel. All that they did was to keep alive in him the belief, or hope, that others besides himself were the enemies of the party. Perhaps the rumors of vast underground conspiracies were true after all. Perhaps the Brotherhood really existed. It was impossible, in spite of the endless arrests and confessions and executions, to be sure that the Brotherhood was not simply a myth. Some days he believed in it, some days not. There was no evidence, only fleeting glimpses that might mean anything or nothing. Snatches of overheard conversation, faint scribbles on lavatory walls, once even when two strangers met, a small movement of the hands which had looked as though it might be a signal of recognition. It was all guesswork. Very likely he had imagined everything. He had gone back to his cubicle without looking at O'Brien again. The idea of following up their momentary contact hardly crossed his mind. It would have been inconceivably dangerous even if he had known how to set about doing it. For a second, two seconds, they had exchanged in an equivocal glance and that was the end of the story. But even that was a memorable event and the locked loneliness in which one had to live. Was it the book that was talking about that stuff, or was it a movie he was watching? He's watching a the, the guy named O'Brien speaking on a telescreen. But that sex scene was that. That's go, going on in his mind. He's like oh. imagining having sex with the virgin. Oh, so he's a sick puppy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Winston roused Nine himself. <laughs> yeah, no, he thought. We're not reading out of Penthouse, guys. This is classic uh, American literature. Not American. Classic this was literature. high school requirements back when I was in high school. I was in eighth grade when I read them. <laughs> yeah. Winston roused himself and sat up straighter. He let out a belch. The gin was rising from his stomach. His eyes refocused on the page. He discovered that while he sat helplessly missing, musing, he had also been writing as though by automatic action. And it was no longer the same cramped, awkward handwriting as before. His pen had slid voluptuously over the smooth paper, printing in large, neat capitals, down with Big Brother, five times. I'm not going to say it five times. <laughs> over and over again, filling half a page. You get the point. He could not help feeling a twinge of panic. It was absurd, since the writing of those particular words was not more dangerous than the initial act of opening the diary. But for a moment, he was tempted to tear out the spoiled pages and abandon the Enterprise altogether. But he did not do so, however, because he knew that it was useless. Whether he wrote down with Big Brother or whether he refrained from writing it, 
made no difference. Whether he went on with the diary or whether he did not go on with it made no difference. The thought police would get him just the same. He had committed, would still have committed, even if he had never set pen to paper, the essential crime that contained all others in itself. Thought crime, they called it. Thought crime was not a thing that could be concealed forever. You might dodge successfully for a while, even for years, but sooner or later they were bound to get you. It was always at night. The arrests invariably happened at night. The sudden jerk out of sleep. The rough hand shaking your shoulder. The lights glaring in your eyes. The ring of hard faces around the bed. In the vast majority of cases, there was no trial, no report of the arrest. People simply disappeared always during the night. Your name was removed from the register registers, every record of everything you had ever done was wiped out, your one-time existence was denied, and then forgotten. You were abolished, annihilated, vaporized was the usual word. For a moment he was seized by a kind of hysteria. He began writing in a hurried, untidy scrawl. They'll shoot me, I don't care, they'll shoot me in the back of the neck, I don't care, down with Big Brother, they always shoot you in the back of the neck, I don't care, down with Big Brother. He sat back in his chair, slightly ashamed of himself, and laid down his pen. The next moment, he started violently. There was a knocking at his door. Already, he sat as still as a mouse in the futile hope that whether it was, whether whether it was might, whether it, that whoever it was, might go away after a single attempt. But no, the knocking was repeated. The worst thing of all would be to delay. His heart was thumping like a drum. But his face, from long habit, was probably expressionless. He got up and moved heavily toward the door. Okay, that's the middle of page 20. The next subheading is Roman numeral 2. We'll pick that up on the next okay. video. Yeah, that's that's the okay, end of it. Today. Uh, 11, from 9 to 20. So it sounds a lot like World and War II. he wants II. to bang a virgin. It sounds a lot... Big Brother thing sounds like the Nazis and stuff like that, where they come and took the Jews away and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It sounds a lot like that. That's what was going on when this book was being wrote. And they can only communicate by writing in diaries. The Diary of Anne Frank, see? There you go. Yeah. Anything else you want to say before you move away? Yeah. Um, something about the book? Something about the book? Yeah. Uh, like Doug said, uh, Winston is a sick puppy. Um, I want to know who this sandy-haired woman is who keeps throwing herself over the backs of chairs, but <laughs> I don't remember from reading this in eighth grade uh, who, how important she is. And um, looking forward to more character development with this Goldstein also. And, you know, he's like George Orwell. He's coming very close to making these stereotypical insults about Jews because Goldstein, he keeps saying his nose is very long and thin and has glasses at the end of it. So he's like coming close to just flat out saying Jews, you know. Have big noses. Probably going to be more of them later. That's it. Uh, stay smooth as a dolphin. <laughs> Dry your ankles. Oh, uh, JJ, I just want to say some video. Um, we should name the videos. Um, 1984, the novel pages. Because when you say 1984, people probably won't understand that means the book. Because I was looking at it and like it only got two views. Two views. So yeah. It's a, or, or 1984 by George Orwell. Something like that. I can do that. Okay. Let me say, hold on, hold on, let me cut this off. Okay, everybody, that was our story time. Um, we will probably pick up. Are we doing this every day? Are we doing this a couple times a day? Or are we just doing it whenever? I can do a ton tomorrow. A ton tomorrow? Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, thank you, everybody, for watching, listening. Um, and also, this is the new uh, talents for War Warcraft. Uh, I've done over a couple of characters that I'm working on. Um, this is what I choose, and I ch um, thought that might be useful for other people. And um, enjoy your um, time. Thank you. Bye.